Good evening and greetings of peace. My name is Yusuf Ismail and the program you're watching is I Beg to Differ. This program focuses on interactive debate on socio-economic, political, cultural and religious issues affecting us as South Africans and certainly looking, examining and unpacking some of the global dominant trends in the international community. The spike in advocacy against the so-called white genocide in South Africa can be traced to a coordinated campaign by a group known as Satelanders to bolster international support for white South Africans. The group who described themselves as an emergency plan initiative to prepare Protestant Christian South Africans for a coming violent revolution believe that a race war is inevitable and have spent years in preparing for it. The group's membership was first reported to have swelled after the murder of Afrikaner uh, Weerstand Bewegung leader Eugene Terreblanche, and then it was the death of former Nelson Mandela that was meant to trigger the war. Although this has never transpired, now it is the murder of white farmers that the Satelanders have seized on as a signal of the seeds of a plan to exterminate white people. Well, joining us via Skype for the first time on I Beg to Differ, we're joined by Simon Roach. Simon is, in fact, a spokesperson for Satelanders and an activist. Welcome, Simon, to I Beg to Differ. It's, uh, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you. Let us start off with this, Simon. Um, you've been quite vocal over a number of years, I believe from 2017 onwards, that there is at the very present point in time, um, if not genocide, but factors that you describe as possibly leading up to the genocide of whites or white farmers in particular. Can you expand on what you mean and define what you basically are referring to? Yeah, very simply, uh, Yusuf, we have never used the word genocide. So you won't find in any video or interview done in the USA or from South Africa or wherever else speaking at the European Parliament us saying that there is a genocide because the word genocide has a very particular meaning and we don't play fast and loose with these things we, we would like to believe that we are quite serious people what has happened though is that many people have picked up on what we've said and they have uh, imported the word genocide into that narrative what we have said is that there is a sustained methodical systematic campaign uh, to, uh, of farm attacks and farm murders. And international experts, in fact, introduced that idea, not us. We weren't the first to say it. The head of World Genocide Watch, Dr. Gregory Stanton, came to South Africa, not at our behest, and long before we began speaking about this thing. And he said, look, if, 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 I should just point out that this is the world's foremost genocide expert. And uh, he said, look, after studying this matter for a number of years, he was a, a, a teacher, a lecturer in Swaziland for many years, so he knows South Africa well. He said, it's clear that this is systematic. It's not random. It's not, you know, spontaneous. So uh, uh, it's good for us because we can see that. The farmers can see that. The farmers tell you it doesn't make sense, man. This thing didn't come out of thin air. So there does seem to be a, a systematic, methodical campaign of murder of white farmers. No two ways about it. And uh, that's what we have brought uh, uh, to the attention uh, uh, of the world. I, I want to bring up, I want to basically, because I want to look at what Gregory Stanton stated. But before I go to Gregory Stanton, um, there was a report by Gareth Newham, who we've um, attempted to have on this program some time back. Gareth Newham from the Institute of Security Studies. It's a South African research group. His quotation, I'm going to just give you the quotation. He says, there's no evidence to support that. There's no evidence that a group of people are killing farmers for a purely political purpose, although farm killings are taking place. He says, there's no evidence they're doing it because they're listening to political leaders. It is happening because of crime. Now, <clears throat> you mentioned um, Graham Stanton, um, uh, Gregory Stanton from Genocide Watch, but I've seen subsequent mm. articles by Gregory where he's apparently condemned <clears throat> the misuse of his group's reports uh, of the threat of polarization in South Africa to further the idea of white genocide in the sense that he's been, uh, according to him, misquoted. One of the users of mm. Genocide Watch's um, model for genocide prediction 
is a claim by mm. South, some South Africans that South Africa is undergoing a white genocide or possibly factors leading to mm. a white genocide. But Genocide Watch has never made that particular claim. And Gregory Stanton has stated oh. that there's been an appropriation, a misappropriation of what he basically stated. You're probably familiar with that. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's perfectly correct. Um, he doesn't use the word genocide and we don't use the word genocide. We quote from a speech that he gave at the Transvaal Lampo Ini, TLU, it's still called that, uh, headquarters in two, 2014, if I'm not mistaken. Right towards the end of the speech, you can still find it on YouTube now, he talks about there is... Uh, 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 somebody behind this thing, I can't remember his exact words and I don't want to misquote him, but we have precisely the same disposition and so do the farmers. So the world's leading expert on genocide is not calling it a genocide, but he's saying that this thing is methodical and systematic. The farmers are saying that and we're saying that. Okay, yes, let, me just, let, let me just unpack this um, because I, I just want to understand St. Landa's position. Uh, is St. Landa stating that I mean, no one denies the fact that there are farm murders. I mean, I'm a criminal law practitioner, and I see it myself, certainly in some of the aspects. But is St. Landa's position is that farm murders are, the, are, are certainly at the crescendo of all criminal activity in South Africa, or are they saying that it is certainly, uh, certainly a concern, but amongst many other criminal activities, such as murder in a general sense in South Africa? Because I saw the report by Lindsay Schuttel, who's a journalist, she stated that the peak of farm murders was 1997-1998, where the number was around about 153-154. But today, according to many stats, the number is below 50. She stated that some of the murders of white farmers may indeed have been racially motivated. But South Africa is a country with violent crime in any rate. Um, uh, and, 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 and in the period, for example, between July 2017 and 2018, um, 47 farmers of all races all races were killed in South Africa and targeted, not just systematically, white farmers in general. The worst year was way back in 1998, 153 farm murders. Since then, there's been a deterioration. Yeah, but yeah, thank God for that. The farmers have taken extraordinary measures. I think what you're uh, uh, neglecting to mention there is that there's been a decline in the number of farm murders, but an increase in the number of farm attacks. That's very clear from that report. It's explicitly stated there. Um, the, the other point I need to know, and this is what Professor C.R. Snyman, the author of Criminal Law, states. Um, in a recent study, between April 2016 and March 2017, there were a total of 19,016 murders, massively insane in South Africa, but the vast majority of the murders and the victims were in fact blacks. Um, I mean, the point is, Saitlanders, your group certainly seems to ex exude this concern towards whites, and um, shouldn't the focus be on the fact that crime in South Africa is totally out of hand, the ANC has clearly failed, uh, in this particular respect, the Minister of Police, their methods, the corruption within the police. Shouldn't your efforts and advocacy be towards creating a safer so society for all South Africans as opposed to just simply whites in general? Well, that's like saying that uh, because you prefer rugby, the local cricket club, club must become a rugby club. It's, uh, you know, we've often had this accusation leveled at us that we should suddenly change the nature of our group and uh, become something else because it suits somebody else. You know, let all of the uh, advocacy groups uh, do their work in their various spheres. If you feel so strongly about it, why don't you do it? We have chosen, out of free will, to be a civil defense organization preparing for civil war, we believe that that civil war is liable to occur along racial lines, that the likelihood in a society like ours is that if nationwide anarchy breaks out after a cataclysm of some sort, that people will turn against one another. This is a, a fact of history. And we're saying we're not going to store up nuclear bombs. We've never been accused of having mortars and of having stolen cannons from the state armory or anything like that. As decent, respectable family people who pay their taxes and who work hard.
We are going to endeavor to take the precautions necessary to protect our people. So there is a, a focus along those lines, and we draw upon the farm murders thing to illustrate the severity of the onslaught on uh, the, on the farming community. But, but, we believe it is a methodical thing. So, it's specifically designed to get the farmers off the land. And as you say, there are 19,000 murders. It sounds terrible. It sounds fantastic. But the first thing that comes to mind for me is lies, damned lies, and statistics. That 19,000 belies the fact that, as you correctly said, it's now under 40. The last uh, figure that I saw was 47. If you count, uh, if you look at the names, it's very clear that only one of those people is black. I mean, it's not, there's no ambiguity. Uh, well, so wait, hold, hold on. Are, are you saying, okay, so, so just as, uh, you, you've said a lot in, 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 that, in that particular sentence, and you say our people. I just want you to define our people. For example, if you talk black farmers, black farmers that are being murdered, would you consider them your people? One black farmer on that list, that last released list of 47 names. I, I'm sure you saw it. You know, I have That's seen... That's a rate of 84 white farmers per 100,000. Whether it's convenient or not, whether people like it or not, it's a fact. Uh, but if you look at the facts statistically, between July 2017 and 2018, 47 farmers yes. of all races were killed down in South Africa, down from 66 murdered in July 2016 and Ju July 2017. The point I want to ask you is, number one, there were 47 farm murders of all race groups. Number two, you said our people. Do you see our people as just simply whites? What about black farmers or black people in general? Yeah, in this, yeah, in this context, yes. What we're saying, okay, it's not complicated. We believe that there will be a race war in South Africa because of the nature of the society. We believe that the trajectory of South Africa is such that a crisis is inevitable and that will lead to internal conflict within the, the society. And uh, you can uh, use the convenient term civil war, if you like. Under such circumstances, like it or not, there will be them and us who okay who is let, let us define them and us is it blacks against whites you, we believe that there will be a race war and clearly that implies blacks versus whites in this country obviously there is a large uh, population of indian extraction there is a large pop, uh, population of um, colored extraction and there's a large malay population which people conveniently seem to forget all the time i'm not sure why but in simple terms it would most likely be fought mostly along black-white lines. We can nuance the conversation. We can make it more subtle. We can speak at greater length. But in the interest of brevity, it's going to be a them and us black and white thing. So, so just it's let us just, just say that. We, yeah, sure, sure, Simon. Just let. Uh, I, want, I don't want to interrupt you, Simon. I don't want to interrupt you. Just, just. I want to continue this. So, are you basically saying your position, State Landers' position, is that a civil war between blacks and whites? is not a possibility, but is inevitable. Is that your position, that it's going to happen? Yes, yes sir, it is. And, 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 and the proof for that is in the systematic attacks that you basically point out as happening on a daily basis. That, that is merely one. I think this is very important, Yusuf. Uh, you know, we would come to a great misunderstanding if, uh, if that allegation was, you know, not tempered a little bit. That is merely one of the signs and symptoms of the pieces of evidence of the clues. It happens to be the one that people uh, get attracted to the most, you know, that they are able to dramatize the most. But that's not the only thing we speak about. We speak about the financial crisis in South Africa, the unpayable debt. We speak about the water infrastructure. If there's a water crisis in this country, a real water crisis, and cholera breaks out through three quarters of the East Rand, all hell will be unleashed on us. That's okay. just a scientific fact. Okay, now, there are now, many other things that we... Okay, so, so, so Simon, just, and I want to wrap up because we've got so many other aspects to discuss and look upon. Do you accept then the premise and the facts as presented by Genocide Watch, uh, the Institute for Security Studies, that for a period of one year, 2017 to 2018, there were 47 farmers of all races were killed in South Africa. Do you see that as evidence now for a potential civil war taking place? 
No, not necessarily, Yusuf. You know, with all due respect, if you watch all of the interviews that I've done and the speeches that I gave in the USA, we're not saying because whites are going to be killed, there will be a civil war. Oh, I beg your pardon. We're not saying that because of those 47 farmers, 46 were white, therefore there is going to be a civil war. We're not saying that the, the murder of white farmers is the catalyst for a civil war. It is a symptom of the severe breakdown of our society. And we use the various examples that we give to help people to understand that what the mainstream media tells them is nonsense. Okay. We give a broad array of examples to illustrate the fact that our society is in crisis. And that helps people to understand why we would think that there might be a civil war. Okay, just it's one point. before we, 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 ha we have to go for an ad break quickly, but I just want to, I just want to end up and conclude on this one issue. You've seen the recent xenophobic outbreak of violence in South Africa. Do you agree with me that foreign African nationals in this country have a far greater chance of being killed um, and murdered and executed in, um, on the streets of South Africa as opposed to whites in general? Oh dear me, I'd have to look at the statistics. I mean, white farmers is one category. The broader society is another category. Uh, 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 foreigners is another category. I mean, really, I would have to know the, the statistics. Okay, well, I, I just want you to hold that thought, Simon. We have to go for a quick ad break, as I've been told by my producer, and we're going to be back shortly. And we're going to continue this debate on this ongoing saga in South Africa. We'll see you soon. <laughs> Welcome back to I Beg to Differ, and I'm your host, Yusuf Ismail. And if you just joined us, I am in a fascinating debate with the spokesperson for an organization called Safe Landers in South Africa, Simon Roach. Simon, you've officially been involved with this group, Safe Landers, uh, since early 2017. Um, and, and I've seen Great. some of the reports, basically, um, on you, that, uh, which has basically raised uh, certain questions in some of the journalistic interviews that you've given that apparently you were a card-carrying member of the ANC uh, at some point in time. You, you call yourself a member of the ANC. I see some, some of the other interviews you've had uh, with journalists uh, overseas and indeed in South Africa. Mm. You describe yourself as a student revolutionary, um, a former student revolutionary um, linked and affiliated to the ANC. I just want to know that transition. Were you part of the ANC at some point in time? I know you stated that you have done functions for them, programs. Um, uh, I, I just want to know that so from someone with that background, how was it that you were accepted uh, by uh, the state Landers uh, so easily without any kind of questioning or for that particular matter, uh, interrogation into your former background? I think because my story is not an exceptionally complicated story. When I was at university, I was one of those people who believed that the right thing to do was to um, try to take hands and and uh, build a kind of a new South Africa to find a solution. And I was a card-carrying uh, member of the ANC. In fact, I think I still have one of my membership cards somewhere. Um, a white South African? I mean, I understand. Right to I, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but I mean, you've been questioned and you said you cannot remember which branch member of the ANC were you affiliated with? No, I know exactly which branch. That's absolute nonsense. I, I cannot see why I would ever have said, I don't know which branch I was affiliated with. It was the branch at the University of Natal, Durban. And, 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 and as I understand, basically, at some point in time, you made a transition. You were involved. I mean, you made a pretty late transition, 2017. Um, what, what caused that transition? Look, Yusuf, it happened long before that. I began to see, I, when I was at university, everybody used to chant non-racism, non-sexism, non-tribalism, non-racism, not, you know. And in, I think it was the second cabinet, not the, the government of national unity, uh, Tabo Mbeki's uh, first cabinet, was reported in the weekly mail at that time, now the, the Mail and Guardian, I don't think it had changed its name yet, to be 59% Corsa. And I thought to myself, but hang on, how is it that one, uh, you know, the Corsas form about 9 million of the population of South Africa. 
so under 20 percent how is it that these people have 60 percent representation in this cabinet what happened to the non-tribalism that was the first salient event that led me to become uh to be to begin to believe that this might be one big nonsense story that it might be the wolf sheep's clothing let me put it to you this way god forbid this uh uh yourself but you know when a pedophile wants to do some harm to a child he doesn't come running with a panga mm. and say i'm gonna chop you i'm gonna steal you from your dad and chop you up and eat you he offers an ice cream so it's not beyond the realm of human concepts that the the smiling innocent victim a and c could in fact be the perpetrator that they could be bad guys so that was the first sign and then the arms deal led me to think hang on the evidence is so clear here the money couldn't have fallen in a hole mm. nobody loses five billion it's not, not humanly possible if i gave you five billion you would guard it with your life somebody stole that damn money absolutely and that was about the very major undertaking so over a period of years i became conscious of the fact that the african national congress is not a force for good it is not benevolent it is a wolf in sheep's clothing it is the all-time master of playing the victim while in fact being the perpetrator i i, I agree boss master. I, 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 you know so simon the simon Jubi simon just to, just to interrupt there i agree with you i'm, I'm i Simon, Simon, hold on, Simon. I agree with you. I agree with you on that point. And we discussed that for a long time on these programs. One of the, one of the key issues, for example, is that the great betrayal, which people talk about that the ANC was involved in, started way back in 1985, where apparently leading members of the ANC uh, were meeting with members of the Afrikaner Bruderbond in Sussex, hatching out a plan. You had, for example, Cyril Ramaphosa, who was involved in the trade union movement in the 80s, suddenly jumping on board, uh, becoming the front man for Anglo-American. That greater betrayal is there. What I find problematic is somehow or the other that groups like St. Landers and Afriform, and we had a discussion with Ian Cameron and Ernst Roots, they play this game about the so-called so Roy Khafar, the red threat. The idea, kind of the myth that the ANC is indeed engaged in a socialist enterprise or a Marxist communist agenda, when in reality, for the past 25 years, the ANC has embraced neoliberal, hardcore capitalism to the extreme, leading to the greatest disparity of wealth between rich and poor than ever before. Now that point is there, is that why is a critique by groups like St. Landers and Afri Forum misplaced by creating the threat of the Roy Khafar, when in reality, they've embraced neoliberal capitalism that led to the pro problems of the arms deal, uh, the kind of uh, brought into the, uh, uh, the, this greater multinationals coming over, taking over the economy. That's where the critique should be. But it seems to me that the agenda being portrayed out there is that the ANC is a communist threat which needs to be confronted, when in reality, the critique could be more justified and credible if we identify where the real problem is. Well, you may well be right. You know, you and I could stand next to the side of the road and see somebody walk past and you could say, um, dead certain that that person's name is Fred. And I could say, oh, I'm dead certain his name is Arthur. We're looking at the same person. You have your perception of the ANC, I have mine. What you've said is not false. However, you neglected to mention that this neoliberal policy includes the national health insurance, which is about as socialist as socialist gets. That is the last word in socialist. And that is not even to speak of uh, inducing or, or ob ob obliging, I should say, uh, in insurance funds to invest in government projects. That is as socialist as socialist gets. So my opinion is that the commies masquerading as neoliberals, your opinion is that they are neoliberals and we need look in, no in fact isn't it the opposite it's it's, okay. it's, it, it's don't, don't you think it's the opposite simon it's neoliberal hardcore capitalists masquerading as socialists and communists because i mean they, they talk about talking left but in actual fact walking right there hasn't been a single socialist policy implemented since 1994 to date i mean they've been talking about um, i mean after 94 uh, mandela stated privatization is a way to go uh, nationalization of the mines none of that has happened i mean effectively 
you have economic apartheid continuing for the past 25 years. The poor have gone poorer, the rich have got richer. It's just simply a question of economic apartheid on steroids. Do you agree with me? Yusuf, as far as I'm concerned, the, 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 the mining charter and the banking charter are not outright capitalism. You say that it's a, a continuation of economic apartheid. I don't know, when the BBE, uh, the, the BBE, ah, man, the BBEE -E -E laws, um, uh, when I read them, that doesn't seem rank meritocratic capitalism to me. Well, what it's done the is national, basically... You should read the national... I've Democratic read it. I've studied Revolution. it. And the point what I see... What, 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 I, what I see... So Sorry, Simon. ...of a special type. The ANC, in its own words, is a colonialism where the colonials remain behind afterwards. And the ANC says in these words, and those colonials must be utterly eradicated, firstly by dispossessing them. <laughs> Come on. No, but si Simon, Simon, Simon the, the point is, and, and I think we can get into a debate on this. So, Simon, hold on a second. What we see, and I've seen the charter, it's basically the replacing of one group of elites, which were the whites, with a new group of elites, the blacks who are co-opted. I mean, Anglo-American bankroll apartheid. There's no doubt in that. Come 1994, the front man for Anglo-American was someone that was involved in the trade union movement, Sol Ramaphosa. So, just question of one group of elite replacing another group of elite or being co-opted with the vast majority of South Africans still living in abject poverty. I mean, there's no economic empowerment of blacks. There's economic empowerment of a certain black elite at the expense of the mass of South Africans. Now, can't Saitlander see that? No, of course we can see that. Of course we, but that's hardly the point. So are you saying that effectively, when you talk about egalitarianism, do you call for an egalitarian society? Why are you saying that we should just simply continue when as the trend was? Egalitarian at all. Yusuf, you really, this is the third time now that you've kind of, uh, you've either said explicitly or implied that I've said something that I claim to be a, a revolutionary. I've never claimed to be a revolutionary. We have never spoken about egalitarianism. We're not egalitarian. So oh, you anti we're the opposite of I mean you will never hear us claiming to be egalitarian that's absurd I'm very sorry Yusuf uh, I, I, but that, that, that's a bit concerning for me so if you're not egalitarian you anti egalitarian so uh, when you're talking about class differences who should be at the top Sorry Simon sorry about Look, that Yusuf that you maybe don't play rugby doesn't mean that you're anti-rugby again you insist on making these deliberate um uh, uh straw man arguments uh, arguments based on false logical syllogisms yusuf okay let, 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 let me take this further let me take this further um simon i, I want you to because i want we are meritocratic we are not egalitarian for egalitarianism's sake. This is a word that came out of the French Revolution, and its purpose was to diminish the role of the nobles and the church in French society. Okay. And that's where you get the origin, the, the phrases left wing and right wing. It was the left hand side of the French parliament, the right hand side of the French parliament. These are words with specific meanings. We are not anti anybody who wants to be egalitarian. You can be as egalitarian and fluffy as you like. Okay, we just don't uh, so, so I get, I get your point. In the history of the world. Okay, now I get your point. I see, I see we seem to be having a slight, um, I, I don't want to lose you uh, in terms of the science. So you mentioned an interesting point, meritocracy, which is basically those at the top or those in the best position should be there based on merit. I don't have a problem with that. I'll be honest with you. I don't have a problem with that. You accept that those at the top, those controlling the uh, functions of society, ensuring good service delivery should be there based on merit. And I think we're in agreement on that particular point. Um, but the problem that I want to take it further is that, and, and it brings us back around this particular circle of the inevitable civil war, which is quite disturbing. Um, the, 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 the problem that I have is that a lot of this, a lot of these factors, uh, uh, your, your uh, founder, your leader, Gustav Muller, for example, cited that a lot of the uh, facts surrounding this comes... Uh, uh, based on the interpretations and so-called hallucinations and visions of Nicolaas van Rensburg. Now, 
that, that's someone I, I just want you to unpack because a lot of those in the uh, viewers never heard of Nicolas or Sinner van Rensburg. Here's an individual that is supposed to have had 700 visions. Uh, he had a vision of a sisal plant. His visions have been described as predictions of local events, interpretations leading to the rise of the uh, First World War, rise of communism. Uh, and in South Africa, prophecies that Nelson Mandela's death will be followed by kind of a racial apocalypse. Now, do you believe in Sinner van Rensburg, Sia or Nicolas van Rensburg, and, and are his prophecies, uh, do you see him as a prophet? Do you see him as someone that galvanizes you and your belief system? Uh, Yusuf, uh, I beg your pardon. I don't mean to dodge your question, but you, you gave a long introduction, and there's a, a slightly false premise in that introduction. So I'll, I'll answer you directly once I've got the following out of the way. Um, Sina van Rensburg never ever said that there would be a war following the death of Nelson Mandela. What he said is that one day there will be democracy in South Africa, multiracial democracy in South Africa. And he said there will be a black ruler on the throne of South Africa. He said when that ruler dies, at the time that he dies, the ruler that is then on the throne of South Africa, so the first, oh, and he said that the first ruler would be deemed a saint by the world. Time passes, he dies. He dies at a time when the throne is occupied by a very bad man, a second black ruler or fifth black ruler, whatever, but the guy's on the throne, a very bad man. He said quite separately, very, very separately, the, the, it's not the same vision or dream or prophecy or whatever you like. He said separately, a black ruler in South Africa dies by violence. And out of that death comes a civil war. So, so if you don't mind, that correction is okay. very, 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 very... So, 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 so just let me explain this, because you do call yourself a Christian Protestant outfit. Uh, belief, and I, I know mm. many from the Kharia Fumerda, Kark, um, and, and so on, and I engage a lot with pastors and religious uh, faith groups and uh, interfaith dialogue. The question I need to ask you is that as a Christian outfit, which you yourselves identify, which is fine, identifying yourself as a Christian outfit, do you see a Nicolas von Rensburg as a prophet? Yes, we do. Yes. And a prophet who received visions and inspiration from God a hundred years ago? Yes. And yes. that basically is your inspiration by uh, certainly people like Gustav Muller in forming groups like Saitlanders. Uh, yeah, well, it's not the only inspiration, but it is a relevant, pertinent, germane, contributing factor. Yes, uh, yes, you are absolutely correct, but by no means the only one. But don't you think, don't, don't you find it somewhat disturbing the fact that a lot of emphasis is placed on his prophecies, which I need apocalyptic. It's like those who, you know, were waiting for the final apocalypse in Israel or the Armageddon, final Armageddon, is as if, as if that this inevitability is sustained, certainly what we see on the ground level, but by and large, systematically, by what he said 100 years ago. No, I don't find it disturbing. So what he said was what changed you, correct? You came across his book, and that changed you. Uh, well, look, there were numerous events that, that uh, took place. It was one of the salient, seminal moments in my life, yes, but the one, no, it was not the one. It was not the thing that changed me. Okay. It was one of many events that opened my eyes to the madness of the new South African rainbow nation, which is dominated by crime and violence and corruption and sheer insanity. Um, what, and I, 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 don't, I don't disagree with you with the last point. It is certainly, we're living in an insane country. No one denies that, and I think we're on par with that. What would you identify and describe in your writings, not your writings, certainly the writings of Saitlanders, Night of the Long Knives? What do you mean by that? What? Uh, this refers to a particular uh, prophecy. Uh, Wimsina van Rensburg said that there would be a, a civil war that would break out. He said that it would begin... Uh, it, in the run-up to the Civil War, he said that there would be a wave of migrants into Europe. Okay, that's what, just one of the many kind of milestones that he gave. I'm not going to bore you with all of them. Yeah. And uh, th there were various others. He said, this all then culminates in a night in which this race-based 
civil war begins. And that is the night of the long knives. Now, the, the problem that I have is von Rendsburg, and I'm going to move on to this I just, before we go for the ad break. He was a farmer. Yes. He, only, he only read the Bible, but was unable to write anything besides apparently his own name. Um, and Sinner obviously means seer in the Afrikaans language. A lot of Afrikaners, indeed those uh, uh, amongst center-right, far-right, even amongst some certain conservatives, have rejected him as a false soothsayer, a false prophet. I mean, because the belief that one day white would be slaughtered en masse could be traced to the earliest white settlers on the tip of, South of Africa. And that basically is the fact that they point out that a lot of his uh, 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 soothsaying was basically inherently based on paranoia. Mm. Yes, of course, it's like that in any society. Uh, I may reject some of your religious beliefs, you reject some of mine. Some of the Afrikaners reject belief in the divine veracity of uh, Sina van Rensburg. This is a, a normal thing. Okay, uh, uh, don't go away. Um, uh, we, we're just going to have to go for a quick ad break, and when we're back, we're going to continue the discussion. We'll see you shortly. <music> Welcome back to I Beg to Differ. I'm your host, Yusuf Ismail. And if you've just joined us, we are in an interesting conversation with uh, the spokesperson for St. Landra, Simon Roach, who joins us via Skype. Um, Simon, let me just get back to you. Um, I saw a report by a history professor, Franz Johann Pretorius. Um, I don't know if you heard of him. Mm -hmm. He's a history professor at the University of uh, Pretoria. Um, and, and he basically is says, if, sorry, I beg your pardon, is it F. H. Pretorius, is the middle name H, I didn't catch it clearly. It's Franz Johann Pretorius, Franz Johann Pretorius. Oh, F. J. Pretorius, yeah. okay, I don't, no, I don't know him. Well, sorry, and, uh, I think he's a professor me. of political studies, and he basically okay. says in relation to, for example, um, groups like your Saitlanders and so on, he says, and this is a quote, the loss of power in 1994 was difficult for these people, they lived in a dream world then, and they prefer to continue living in that dream world today. And this was in relation, and I want you to possibly comment on the fact that um, when, when uh, for example, the idea was that a black uprising would occur at the end of white minority rule fested, then the prophecies shifted to Nelson Mandela's death um, and beyond. And I think the Saitlanders made the point that um, at Mandela's death, Members go on holiday to safe havens, um, and on the website, they take an emergency evacuation, which included canned food, a Bible, a rucksack, tampons to send, bleeding wounds, and so on and so forth. That never happened. But when I look at it, and when Franz Johan Pretorius comments on it, this is like something from the movie by Mel Gibson called Conspiracy Theory, um, where there's this idea that you are now in survival mode uh, and have to basically get yourself ready because of this inherent fear that you're going to be attacked, mm. going to be destroyed and eliminated. And then he points out the fact that this is in reality a dream world. Um, he's an Afrikaner academic, and he says that the loss of power in 1994 was essentially difficult for these people, leading to the inherent paranoia that they see. Afri Forum, Ernst Roots, uh, a number of other groups disagree with you, and of course they've got the right to disagree. But the idea that is being presented, isn't it a bit too extreme, too far-fetched? Going away in a rucksack, well, taking your Bible away, canned food, all of that? Well, l let me say that the, the loss of power in 1994 was not a bad thing for me personally. I made a lot of money out of becoming a specialist uh, projects manager and doing a hang of a lot of work for uh, the African National Congress as a party and uh, the government. Um, uh, so uh, I'm not sure that that applies to me necessarily. Um, I don't think that it's extreme to be effectively a prepper for a crisis under under the circumstances in which we labor at the moment. You, you may disagree, but there are many of us who would say that um, if J. Pretorius is entitled to his opinion, 
but it, that he's blind to what's occurring in the country around us, with or without St. Londres, with or without our beliefs, with or without our neurosis and paranoia. So, so, so at the end of the day, you know, the, the, the idea that, for example, Mandela's death would lead to this genocide, that never happened. No, no, but that, that, that is a fallacy, and I, I say it with, with respect, uh, Yusuf, I'm not saying it in defense of us, you can go and independently verify this. There are different dreams, different prophecies, completely separate. He said the death of a black leader, or of a great black leader, will lead to this, this violence. He didn't say that the first leader on the throne of South Africa is necessarily that leader. He never said that, but... Let me tell you something, Yusuf. Do you remember Deborah Patter yeah. announcing Nelson Mandela's death early? Uh, in 2000, that? are you talking about in 2013? In November, uh, November, December 2013, right? Do you remember that she was, at the time, working for the BBC, and she was the one and only person who said, Nelson Mandela has died. And, and it was supposedly false. Right? She's yeah. exaggerating. She's bulldusting. Do you remember that event? I, I recall something, some discussion. is like, for example, the 9-11 Towers, World Trade Center 7, spoken on the news as no, having no, no. fallen down before no, that. What are... Yeah, exactly. Ex right, you're correct. Exactly. Precisely. BBC reported the World no. Trade Towers fell down. World Trade Tower 7 fell down, and it was still up and running, and then it fell down some half an hour later, something along that line. I remember something yeah, similar. Exactly. Exactly, you are perfectly correct. Deborah Patter on BBC said, Nelson Mandela has just died. And everybody remained silent and she was quietly fired from her job. She didn't tell a lie. I was appointed the project manager of Nelson Mandela's funeral five years before he died. And let me tell you, as an insider, he didn't die on the day that... They said he died. So when did he die? When this did he not die? An opinion. He died prior. This is not an opinion, Yusuf. This is a fact. It might sound like conspiracy theory to you. It might sound nutty. It's okay. It's not the end of the world. I'm going to carry on with my life. You're going to carry on with your life. But we know that there are shenanigans in the background that appear to connect very closely to Sina von Rensburg's prophecies. I'm not, I'm not conflating the prophecies now. I've already separated them for you. But at the time, we thought to ourselves, something is very, very fishy here. Let's be on standby. We, we have four codes. Code yellow, uh, green, yellow, orange, and red, which signify, you know, like the, the United States uh, a def, a DEF CON concept. Hmm. And we didn't even go out of green. We yeah. weren't hysterical. We weren't neurotic. We weren't paranoid. We just said to our members, guys, who knows? This event could lead to ructions. It could destabilize the country. There could be a power struggle. Prepare yourselves. Don't get worked up. Don't panic. But make sure that your stuff is packed so that if there is a crisis in this country, as there have been in every country in the history of the world, mm. If it is our turn, that you are prepared and ready to leave built-up areas. Okay. Honestly, Yusuf, it's as simple as that. Well, you I need to take. We, we, uh, you know, I would love. I would love to unpack that further. I mean, just the time is at a premium. We have to move on. Your leader, I mean, Jacques Pau. You know, Jacques Pau, the journalist who's written the book, The yes. President's Keeper Against Jacob Zuma. He did a report, yes, I think, um, on the organisation Saint Landers. Uh, he pointed out. This is a quote: Saint Landers leader Gustav Muller is surrounded by police agents and he has made, been made a police project. And this was a quotation mm -hmm. given by a former confidant of Muller's, who apparently admitted to the city press that um, he was a police agent instructed by his handler, a crime intelligence colonel, to infiltrate uh, St. Landis. He goes on to state that Muller was a bankrupt businessman owing hundreds of thousands of rands and three judgments against him. Um, the, the, the point being made behind this is that um, he, his, his, whole, his whole argument, the whole argumentation behind this is that Muller himself comes from quite shady backgrounds and credentials. Um, and some of the, what, what's concerning is that a lot of Afrikaners, even those on the far right, have distanced themselves um, to your organization because of the radical policies and views that you hold. To the extent yeah, that some of them well, describe you as fascist. 
fascist, as a fascist organization. Even though you distance yourself from neo-Nazi groups, they describe you as fascist, and we want to unpack this. <coughs> Look, you, you said very much there, Yusuf. It's a, it's a lot to deal with. As far as Mr. Miller's um, background is concerned, I don't think, I think it's fair to say, I'm not saying you should agree with me, but I think it's fair to say that it's a transparent, clear, clean background apart from one event. You know, there, there are not multiple allegations of having, you know, uh, uh, affairs with women, getting drunk, falling down, yeah. whatever the case may be. There's one salient allegation against him, and that is the bankruptcy. And that has been dealt with in the past. I, I, I don't want to uh, dodge your questions, but this has been dealt with over and over and over again, in which Mr. Miller presented the information. He said, that is where I wrote the check that bounced. This is the check against which I wrote it. How could I have known that the person who was paying me was giving me a dodgy check? In trusting them, I wrote a check that bounced. And there was a series of repercussions. He provided documentary evidence in black and white. You may reject it. You might say, ah, oh, it's just a story. But we have dealt with it. We have dealt with it over and over and over again. Okay. I, and I don't, I don't want to cry. That, that's, his, that's his personal right. life. And, so, I, and I respect that. Simon, I respect that. But right. the, the me, the more... The more as far as, yeah, sure. As far as the infiltration is concerned, there is no doubt that we are very heavily infiltrated, that we are saturated by spies. It stands to reason. You uh, know, I, I don't need to explicate. I can go on to the next theme. Yeah, yeah sure, sure. But uh, just on, on that point, I don't want to take you off that theme. In 2002, the forerunner, the handler, stated that a senior officer who was known to Jacques Pau was told to befriend Muller and infiltrate, build up, and recruit more agents for Saitland Aksi. That's your forerunner, Saitlander's forerunner. As a kind of a, um, a kind of getting information on more extreme right-wing groups. So the, the point be behind Jacques Pau is that Jacques Pau is saying that St. Landers is purely an intelligence front to infiltrate the more extreme right-wing networks that may have violent tendencies within the Africana community. What do you say about that? I would say that that's nonsense. I don't, uh, I don't believe for a second that Mr. Miller has set up this organization for the purpose of being controlled opposition. That's the term, right? Yeah. Where the state sets, sets, sets up its own opponent so that it can control its opponent. Uh, it's a very clever thing to do. I, I don't believe that that is what Saitlanders is about. Uh, and I think if that was... The possibly. Case, is it possible? Is that possible? I, I don't believe that it's possible. I think if it was the case, Yusuf, we would have far greater contact with other right-wing organizations, whereas the, the right-wing uh, in South Africa accuses us over and over and over and over again of being arrogant, standoffish, and supercilious, that we don't mix enough with them, that we think that we're superior and we're special, and we don't get involved in other right-wing initiatives. If our purpose was to infiltrate the broader right wing, we would deal with them, but we keep well clear of them. So I think it's false. Okay, let's go on. And we, again, time's running out. There's so much more to discuss. Um, I think in 2017, 2018, and I believe next week, you're going back to the United States. Um, I've seen some of the interviews. By the way, Alex Jones, I had some discussions with him years back, um, back when he was exposing the Bohemian Grove and so on. Um, but one of the questions raised by, I think, Stefan Molyneux, Stefan Molyneux asked the question, I think, in the, and, I, and I listened to the entire interview, where apparently, um, you know, you were being questioned by newspapers and outlets about meeting, for example, people like David Duke and individuals with extremist backgrounds. And your point was, and your response was that, um, well, you met everybody and... Um, we don't have to agree with them, which I respect. I'm having you on my, I'm giving you a platform on this show. I don't agree with your position, but I'm giving you the platform. The one question, and, and I respect that, 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 that point of view, but the one um, concern was that you did take platforms in openly uh, what could be described far-right fascist organizations. The one organization which, and I listened to the entire 45-minute speech, was a New Century Foundation. Um, uh, running a magazine called American Renaissance. It's founded in 1990 by yes, Jared Taylor. Yes. You spoke on their platform. Yes. Um, you shared the platform yes. and you galvanized the public and sought to basically rev them up. I saw the, the passionate speech that you gave. What was, what was the rationale behind them? 
What is the rationale behind speaking uh, me, behind an openly fascist organization? Let, let me give you a, a coherent answer. You've said a few things, so if I address each of them, then very quickly we can come to a, a point that makes sense for your viewers and listeners. When, prior to going to the USA, we obtained a database of, let's call them, if you like, conservative organizations, certainly not right-wing. Many of them were churches that were anti-abortion, for example. Hmm. The database was 936 names. So we corresponded with all of you know, we sent out, we didn't do research on each and every single individual. We could never have. We didn't have the resources. It was myself and Andre could see her working alone on this project. So we get to the USA and the next person on the list is Dr. David Duke. We didn't know him from Adam. People can believe us or disbelieve us. We've only ever had one story and we're sticking to that story because it's the truth. Every organization that we met, we discovered, as it were, for the first time. We did not spend an hour researching each one of those 936 organizations that we approached. That's 936 man hours, for goodness sake. And I, I don't, I'm not directing my, uh, my irritation at you, but at this ongoing kind of allegation. So we meet David Duke. We meet him in Louisiana at Lake Pont Train. He lives yeah. near the Lake Pont Train, And he said to us, if you want to talk to me, if you want my time, you've got to take me for lunch. So we said, okay, fine. We took him for lunch. We held a long conversation, and it became clear that we didn't share his views. His views are very far right wing. We left that lunch, and we never spoke to him again. He said to us, um, would you like to come on my radio show? It gets, including uh, repeats, you know, forwards or whatever you want to call it, mm. about two million listens, which would have been by far the greatest opportunity that we'd ever dreamed of. We didn't even reply. We have never been on his radio show in spite of the fact that it would gain us incredible exposure amongst right-wingers in the world. We don't share his opinions and beliefs and convictions. As far as the New Century Foundation is concerned, Amrin, Jared Taylor, there's something that you must understand. Jared Taylor is generally regarded as kind of milk toast. He's right wing, he's very pro white, he's very pro his history and his culture and so on, but he never condemns any other races or groups or religions. And he's famous for it. The right wing is in the USA, or many of them hate him for the fact that he won't acknowledge, for example, a Zionist Talmudic Jewish conspiracy, and you can see it across the length and the breadth of the internet. But Your research for this interview has been outstanding. I must commend you for it. So I'm not saying that there's a weakness on your research. Clearly, you've done a, a tremendous amount of research. There's no criticism. But if you were to do more research, you would see that what I'm telling you is the truth. I, 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 but Jared but, Taylor is not a neo-Nazi. He's not a fascist. Well, He's not a neo-Nazi. Dumb okay, well, well, on that point, and I, I, we, because we're going to have to wrap this up, the, the reason why you, the, the people are critiquing you for not having met up with David Duke, because according to uh, mm. you and Shaitlanders, David Duke is anti-Jewish, he's anti-Israel, anti-Zionist, whereas Jared Taylor is not. But Jared Taylor, you says he in his magazine, American Renaissance, they promote <laughs> pseudoscientific studies that uh, blacks are intellectually inferior to whites, um, although they, they couch it in highfalutin language. I've got a quote from American Renaissance. There is a difference between blacks and whites analogous to the difference in intelligence, in psychopathic personality. For psychopathic personality, the means and distribution are higher amongst blacks. The effect of this is that there are more black psychopaths and more psychopathic behavior amongst blacks than amongst whites. And certainly, white intelligence is far superior to that of blacks. Now, this was Richard Lynn in the American Renaissance, the magazine produced by, uh, new, um, by the New Century Foundation. Jared Taylor does promote yeah. scientific racism. I mean, he promotes the idea that whites are intellectually superior to blacks in a general sense, um, which David Duke touches on, but is more anti-Jewish than the New Century Foundation. Mm -hmm. What is quite surprising is that when you, when you also stood up and gave that lecture, you were standing directly in front of a fasci, which I found quite remarkable. The fasci 
which is the, the, um, the, the actual, uh, you may not have noticed it, the tent pole with the, the fasci wrapped around it, which the Roman Empire has used and the Nazis used as well, which clearly indicate fascism. But I mean, he promotes scientific racism. Do you agree with him on that point? You know, uh, uh, the reason you have to ask, and I say this with respect, I'm thoroughly enjoying talking to you, and I, I'm not at all, uh, you know, uh, I'm not being funny or, or what have you. Um, the reason you have to ask that question is because there isn't evidence. There isn't evidence because we, this, this, this obsession that people have on the right wing with racism and with anti judaism and it's all a Muslim plot, and it's this, and it's that, and the Vatican is controlled by Babylon, which is an ancient... It, we don't get into this bullshit. We just don't get into it. We have other things to worry about. There are little girls being raped on farms. Our economy is on, it, it's, it's on its very last legs. ESCOM's debt is 450 billion rand hour. Gross domestic product of South Africa is just over a trillion rand. Yeah, it's shocking. ESCOM alone owes almost half of the GDP of South Africa. We don't have a need to get engaged in all this racial and anti-Jewish and anti-Muslim and anti-black. And we, we have enough on our plates. Thank you very much. And, and Simon, really, speak, speaking of... Yeah. Speaking about ESCOM, I'm having yeah. Ted Blom, Ted Blom, the energy yeah. analyst. I mean, we've had him multiple times where we unpack ESCOM and the rot within ESCOM. Nobody denies that. And that's why I'm saying, mm -hmm. why don't you come on board? If Jared Taylor did provide and does provide scientific racism, he believes that blacks are intellectually inferior to white. Stefan Molyneux believes the same thing. Um, I'm just questioning, do you, do you, do you accept that, that aspect? Do you accept that psychopathic tendencies amongst blacks are higher than amongst whites. Do you accept that? That's like asking me whether I accept some tenet, some hadith or sunnah. I don't know, I don't care, it doesn't bother me. I have so much else to worry about. You know, I'm going to Europe in a few weeks' time. We're going to meet with very interesting people and we're not going to discuss one word of race. Why? Why on earth get bogged down and obsessed by that nonsense? We have a mandate to provide a national emergency plan for a civil war in South Africa. We frankly don't care what you or your producer or your sister or your mother or your best friend or your business colleague have to say on race, on religion, what have you. We are introspective and that has always been our, our, um, our way. Okay. Well, Simon, just hold that. We're going for a last ad break and then we're going to be back shortly for the final wrap up. We'll see you All soon. Right. Welcome back to I Beg to Differ, and we are finally wrapping up this passionate, intense discussion. Simon, once again, lastly, wrap this whole thing up. Um, so, a civil war, according to you, is going to happen in this country in the next few years, correct? Yeah, it seems pretty inevitable that the trajectory of South Africa is going to lead to a cataclysm, yes. And will this be just simply white against black? Or will you have a black against white? Or would you have a situation where whites obviously take arms and attack blacks as well? No, I don't think so. That would be suicidal. You know, there's some people on the right wing who talk like that. Um, I don't want to use strong language, but they're very, very bolshy, uh, very bombastic, you know. We're going to, you know, mess them up kind of thing. Um, but it, that's the, the talk of fools. Uh, the white population of South Africa is so small that any white right-winger who thinks that he can take on the entire new South African rainbow nation, is he, he's a fool, uh, with all due respect. So our plan is to withdraw from the conflict. And that's why people co call us cowards. They say that we're running away and so on and so forth. That is the allegation that is uh, leveled at us uh, constantly. We want to withdraw draw from this conflict that we see as inevitable. Does the murder of black women, children and babies bother you? And why haven't you taken this up as an advocacy group? Because that's, that's not our role. I mean, why hasn't, I don't know, 
the South African Rugby Union taken it up. It's not our role and our purpose. It has got nothing to do with us. Any more than, than Jack Russell's have got anything to do with the Nelson Mandela Children's Hospital and burnt children have got anything to do with the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. It's an absurd suggestion that we should suddenly be taking up causes that have got nothing to do with us. But, we have a specific mandate. But you, you spoke clearly. You spoke about rape of children. Those were white children. You spoke yeah. about murder, murder of white people. I'm saying murder affects yes. all race groups, all colors across the board. Murder is something which affects us. More black people are murdered daily than whites. More black babies and children are raped daily than whites. Surely we're talking about murder. They're human beings. The only difference between them and you is they are black and you're white. Yeah, but we're not pro it. It's not like we're encouraging it for pity's sake. Are more black people being killed than whites in this country? In, in absolute terms, yes. In proportionate terms, absolutely not. Do you consider the murder of 47 white farmers uh, proportionately equivalent 46. to the murder of blacks? No, it's far higher. It's far, the maths are simple. Uh, but Africa Watch and Genocide Watch gave the figure. The Institute of Security Studies, Gareth Newham, stated 47 white farm murders between June 2017 to July 2018. Proportionately, I mean, if you talk about proportionately, can that be even viewed as an equivalent to the murder of blacks? No, it's far higher. How many? How many? Well, the 25,000 uh, white farmers approximately left in South Africa. Those figures are per 100,000. Okay. The national uh, 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 murder rate in South Africa is uh, 37, uh, 36 point something uh, per 100,000. Now, if you multiply, you keep saying 47, but only 46 of the 47 were white farmers, right? So you've got to multiply 46, not 47. Okay. One of those farmers was black. So you multiply 46 into 100,000, 25 into 100,000 goes four times. 46 times four is 184. Okay. How as many? Simple as that. It's 184 uh, per 100,000 versus 37 per 100,000. This is not sophisticated. And this is what we keep saying to people. It's simple maths. You don't have to like it. You don't have to do anything. Okay. Let, let's let's end math. on this point. Reality, <laughs> the mathematical reality is that there is a far higher proportion and exceedingly far higher proportion of white farmers being murdered in South Africa than in any other category these are scientific terms now listen please category class or group end of story i'm okay. very sorry but this is si simon simon between december 2018 and october yes. 2019 how many white farmers were killed how many the the government hasn't released the statistics so but but i mean i, I thought you i thought a group like satelanders would have the statistics no, we don't collate statistics. We are not a, a farm murder uh, defense advocacy group. We draw upon those statistics to enlighten people as to the severity of the crisis in our country. Okay. Lastly, We're not um, specialists in farm murder. We quote other specialists and we say, look, look. Look at, at these numbers. Does that not tell you something? We do exactly the same with banking. I'm not a banker. I'm not even an accountant. But I can draw upon the facts and the figures and the data and the statistics that the experts produce to help people understand that there is one massive financial crisis looming over South Africa. It doesn't make me a... Come on, man. But, but, but uh, lastly, and I don't want to uh, uh, grudge the point, but when I gave you the stats from the experts, you disagreed. I said uh, the Institute for Security Studies released the figure of 47, 2018 to 2019. Uh, 2017 to 2018, they said 47, you said 46 are white, give or take, that's a point. 47 still no, proportionately is not equivalent to the murder of black people. They are saying that 47 farmers were murdered. I am making the point to you that it would be a lie if I said 47. I have to say 46 because I know that only 46 of the 47 were white. So if I say a certain proportion, a certain percentage of uh, white farmers is being murdered, I must tell the truth. And it's not 47 whites, it's 46. Okay. One of the farmers was black. Do you believe, and your position may be different from that of Saitlanders, that blacks by their nature are inherently violent? Do you believe that? 
You know, it, it, I, I don't want to sound like those white people who say, I never supported apartheid, and my best friend is black. But I spent many, many years, this is indisputable, incontrovertible, working with some of the kindest, gentlest human beings you will ever meet. Cyril Ramaphosa's niece, Pindilim Kabela, and I were business partners. She is the most generous, compassionate, merciful, sweet human being you will ever meet. Her business partner, Marang Setwayelo, is the most tolerant, patient, long-suffering person you will ever meet. Jameson Klongwani, Wanda Shwenyani, Abi Mokwasani, these are people I know and love for the good that I have seen in them. I don't, it doesn't occur to me from one day to the next to obsess about these things. Are oh, whites better than blacks? What I'm obsessed by is the fact that there is clearly a threat that is emerging which will focus itself at some point in time when people are hungry and dispossessed on the white minority population of South Africa. And you've heard what, what Ace Magoshule, Julius Malema, and... Um, uh, uh, David Mabuza, David Mabuza have said about whites recently. You know what Julius Malema said on Thursday, the 6th of November, 2016. I'm not calling for the slaughter of all whites yet. You know what the scientific studies are about the uh, Bulala Mabuno and, uh, I mean, Tuboli Bono and uh, Auletum Shinwam. You know that. And, and we feel threatened and afraid. Okay. It's not the same thing as getting up in the morning and saying, oh, all black people are bad. That's bullshit. I can tell you it's bullshit. I know it because I've seen it and experienced it firsthand. I've seen the, the beautiful black people that I've worked with. Lastly, and lastly, awesome. Simon, we're wrapping up. Lastly, segregation between whites and blacks, which some have attributed to Gustav Muller, um, which he apparently said. Do you believe that that is viable today in South Africa? Gustav Muller is basically on record, as some journalists have called it, Jag Pao, that segregation between whites and blacks may be the alternative. Do you believe that it is sustainable? Yo, I would say to you that where you have absolutely contradictory cultures, such as you had in the Yugoslav Civil War, I mean, you saw what happened there. They could not reconcile the, the, the Eastern Orthodox, the Serbs, the Roman Catholics, i.e. the Croats, and the, the Muslims, the Bosniaks. They could not reconcile. At some point, it was proven that the sustainable option was rather to separate from one another because otherwise they would just fight to the death forever. Do you support and that? Do you, do you support that? Do you support yeah. that? Yes, the notion, the notion of not sharing a space w w with somebody with whose uh, culture, value, uh, culture and values I cannot reconcile. Of course, I'm sure you do. Look, Ugo Twala is on South African law. Not maybe, not could be, not possibly, not perhaps. Ugo Twala remains a concept of African customary law. It permits a man to rape a woman it, and it, pay it, her father damages and then keep her. Let, let me just correct you. Ugo Twala is a criminal offense in South Africa. Ugo Twala is, and I'm telling you as a criminal law expert, it's a criminal offense. But just on that point, so you're saying segregation between whites, blacks and other races is a way to go in South Africa? well that it is practiced and tolerated by the rural communities of the Eastern Cape and of Natal. You know that. It is practiced and tolerated So, 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 so Simon, in the final analysis, Simon, Simon, in the final analysis, apartheid is a solution to white killing. Is that, is that what you're saying? I'm answering your question. I didn't ask the question. I'm just saying, in, your, in the final analysis, are you saying apartheid is a solution to white genocide? You said already it's a criminal act. Now I'm uh, continuing after your interruption. Do I think that it's easy to reconcile some cultural norms and values and practices? It's impossible. It's impossible. Does that mean I don't get on with black people? I lived with black people, not stayed with, not visited with, lived with black people. Lived. But if you ask me about a general concept, a general principle, yes, of course. Of course. Sometimes culture, tradition, Language and religion are insurmountable obstacles. That doesn't mean that I didn't live with black people. That doesn't mean that I didn't sleep in the same room with as black, black people. people for years. Well, Simon, yeah, I, I, 
No, you've, you've got to take the good with the bad. You've got to accept both sides of the argument. Really. Okay, Simon, uh, we have to, we, we, we've, we've run out of time. We've run grossly out of time. Uh, but we will continue this discussion and have this debate probably more interactive in the near future. Till then, Simon, I want to thank you for joining us on I Beg to Differ. And that's all we have for this evening. Join us next week for more interactive debate on I Beg to Differ. Till then, greetings of peace. Assalamu alaikum. And if you're having a journey, travel safe.